Hey, you're listening to the Upright Ninja Podcast, and this is episode number 59 with your host, Tom Hudson. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the UpRev Ninja Podcast. If this is your first time listening, thanks for joining us. This show is produced each week with the single intent of discovering the tips, tricks, hacks, and lessons learned from our guests that has catapulted them into living the best version of themselves. Join your host, Tom Hudson, as he continues his search for the best methods to uprev his life. Now, let's dive into the show. Today's guest is Gordon Jenkins. Gordon is the visible guy. He knows firsthand the impact change has on organizations and individuals. The visible guy is an international speaker, facilitator, and executive coach. Today, almost 80% of his clients are professional service leaders and organizations looking to future-proof their growth. Outside the sector, his clients include a Costa Rican musician, a young female entrepreneur who will be one of Africa's most influential people, disadvantaged social groups, and various philanthropic social causes. With over 20 years experience, the visible guy connects your intrinsic motivation with a big picture, your strategy. You are supported and guided through the maze of self-belief, breaking down barriers, encouraging self-driven accountability, and celebrating success. He has had senior positions for five of the world's leading financial institutions and advised some of Australia's wealthiest private families. He is chair of the Lung Transplant Research Australia, one of the world's top foundations in its field, delivering world's best practice and better life expectancy for lung transplant recipients and their families. He has faced many challenges, some life and death situations. He has ended up in the strangest of places, such as the Asian jungle instead of the Australian outback. He is proof that defining a personal pathway through life's challenges can be one of the most rewarding journeys you will take. You can and will be in control of your outcomes. He calls this your path, our journey. There are two questions he asks every potential client. One, how deep is your desire to make a difference rather than an excuse? Two, are you ready to stop counting the days and make every day count? Welcome, Gordon Jenkins. Hey, today on the Uprev Ninja podcast, I've got Gordon Jenkins with me. Uh, how are you doing today? I'm absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much for asking, Tom. How are you? I'm doing I'm doing great, man. I'm, I'm super stoked to talk to you today and uh, just to you know hear more about you and hear your story and you know what it is that you're trying to do in this world of uh, this crazy ball of dirt that we're all stuck on at the moment. Um, so yeah, well, you just uh, give us a little background. Tell us uh, who you are and how you got to this point in life. Yeah, how I got to this point in life. That's that is a really it is really it's a really interesting question. You know, and um, I've given it a lot of thought, and I've had to give it a lot of thought because of where I am today, and I suppose what's left in my life going forward. And um, I think for a long time, what I've realised, I'm 47 years old now. Um, and I say to people that uh, I feel like I'm, ki- I'm a kid just leaving school for the first time because the world is my oyster, but it's taken me a long time to get to this point. And let, I suppose just let's go back a few years. You know, for a long time, my life was traveling in two parallels, and it's almost like a, a highway. And if you think about one of the lanes was a way that's been orchestrated for me, so the way I process through life. So you, I was very successful. But in a way, I was very invisible at the same time. So if you think about it, you know, I did the traditional thing. I went to school, went to university, went to, uh, started a career in the finance industry. Um, career paths and life paths that you take, not because it's necessarily something that I, I wanted to do. I was never very clever at school. I was dyslexic. Um, I was a mathematical genius, but thick at English. I wanted to do cooking, but I had to do woodwork. But I took a path that, was the traditional path and I took it because I suppose others before me had done it and I thought that must be the right path that's one parallel the other side to as I've come to realize and I've probably realized in the last seven years is that you know I also had this other lane that I kept on crossing into that I was I was really passionate about I was really passionate about why I wanted to exist and both lanes were running together but at one stage of my life they were they were instead of joining smoothly they were knocking each other out and one of the reasons i realized that the traditional career path for me wasn't going to work happened back in 2006 and you know on my on my linkedin profile you can go through there and you see about a very successful career in financial services and professional services in 2006 
my wife, Wendy, had a double lung transplant. And we were both on the corporate ladder. And the corporate ladder stopped immediately. It was a bit like a snake and ladders game. You know, one moment I was at the top of the ladder and the world was my oyster. I was taking, going to be traveling around the world in that great corporate ladder, corporate experience. And next thing, I was on that snake all the way down to the bottom. And I realized then uh, that with Wendy, that she only had a five to seven year life expectancy then. Damn. So I couldn't have a normal job. And I knew then that what I didn't know then was that I needed to care for Wendy. And the system, and I call it the system, simply didn't work. And I also put in commas in that, that it doesn't cater either for carers' needs. So let me th- explain that. So I explain that in the corporate world. Last year, I if I would work, work in a normal job, I would have had 26, 24 weeks off work. Now, there's no way you can have a normal career job no matter where you are and have 24 weeks off work. So the system quite didn't fit, couldn't cope with who I was as a carer. And with Wendy, what's happening with Wendy, what we realized really quickly was that our goals need to change and change rapidly. We now needed to live in 2006. We needed our, our goal was to live as long as possible, have no regrets, be happy, and do what we want. Now, can you remember going? Remember working for a, an international investment bank and saying you want to take 20 weeks off work, right? Or today you don't want to come in. Tomorrow you want you fitting into a system didn't quite work. So, fast forward another six years from 2006 to around about 2012, and Wendy's life expectancy is nearing the end. And this is really interesting, not because she's necessarily ill, but the system says then that life expectancy of someone with a double lung transplant is five to seven years. So I sat down with Wendy and I said to her, well, what do you want to do? She said, well, let's do a holiday of a lifetime. And it really was a holiday of lifetime. And this is a story I I tell to my clients when I'm on stage. And I said, well, if you're not going to live, let's have the holiday of lifetime. And that was from Australia going to Italy, going to France, three-star Michelin restaurants, staying in chateaus, castles, wineries, first-class airfare. And and this is not a joke, but we planned the holiday so that the following year, when her life expectancy was expected to finish, her superannuation, which is like the 401k, and her insurance would pay for the holiday because she would die the following year. So we actually built our holiday, a trip of a lifetime, that bucket list, planning that the following year, Wendy would die and that would pay for the holiday. So this was a high six-figure holiday. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking Australian dollars or US dollars, it's still a lot of money. Yeah. And we really were living the moment. The only problem with that is that we had a such great 10-week holiday that Wendy said, book this, I'm going to live till I'm 85. And I went, no, 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 you can't do this because you're supposed to die and we're supposed <laughs> to pay for the holiday. And she goes, no, no, but I like that holiday. I want another holiday. And I said, well, you can't have another holiday because you're supposed to die. So I said to her, I said, well, when we had that holiday, well, one thing that we really did on that holiday, it suddenly struck us, and I know a lot of people say this now, but for me, it, it hit us then, is that what we've been craving and the thing that we've been craving is we do want to spend more time together. We do want more money, but more, more importantly, we want the freedom to do what we want to do when we want to do it without having the constraints of a two-week holiday or you've got to work on Monday to Friday. So we came back to Australia and I thought, well, crikey, how am I going to do this? How am I going to create my own path? And, you know, and, could I, and can I support others on this journey with me? So I doubled down for the next five or six years. I've doubled down with a few ideas of what that is. So how do I create my own time, my own money, my own freedom? And I've realized that the corporate system doesn't do it. So I created something called The Visible Guy. Now, I have to tell a quick story. The visible guy actually started off as the invisible guy because the invisible guy is two things. One is through my corporate life, whilst I built very successful teams, when there's been corporate takeovers, the visible guy, Gordon, suddenly got lost his job because he didn't have a revenue stream. But what happened when Gordon left the business is the systems and culture and people fell apart. The other thing is, as Wendy's gone through her life and read people ring up and say, how's Wendy doing? How's Wendy doing? How's Wendy's doing? No one's actually said, how's Gordon doing? And for the last 10 years, 12 years, I've struggled. And I've struggled as the primary carer, the primary income earner, taking jobs that were right, taking jobs because I needed the money, not necessarily because it's the right career job for me. 
And I must admit, at times, I really thought, you know, is it worth continuing? Because a very simple solution is to jump off that bridge, is to jump off that bridge and give Wendy, um, you know, that superannuation and to give Wendy that insurance. And when you go to the doctors and you say, hey, I've got a, pro- I've got a problem, and you fill out a form, they take you to a carer who's more interested in understanding about transplant patients than they're caring about you. Um, so the invisible guy was a wrong name because it was actually the visible guy because what I learned how the visible guy was about uh, what I really wanted to do was I wanted to make people visible. I wanted to be memorable, but I also wanted to be intriguing. And I told my mentor what I was going to do about the visible guy. And he said, no, what is a pivotal moment? And you think when you're having a transplant, it's a pivotal moment. This is where it's coming to. And he said to me, Gordon, you know, you need a job with money. And I told him I can't do that because I need to hold down a I can't hold down a job because of the Wendy. And he said, it's going to take you 18 months to set up a business. And I told him, I can't do that. I said, I need to, the business has to work in eight weeks. And he said, why? I said, because I told him in eight weeks time, I needed to pay for Wendy's medicine and uh, medical bills and a medicine. And if I don't have the money, she dies. Eight weeks later, I had the money to pay for the medicine. All right. And that's how the visible guy got created. And, you know, it's a very simple message. And I remember I've got it on my wall and I remember it very easy. You know, Rocky Muhammad Ali didn't say a lot of things, but when they did say things, they said some pretty amazing things. And Muhammad Ali said, don't count the days, make the days count. And really, that's really what I live by today. And that's been the pivotal moment, the pivotal moment of when you're having a transplant, the visible guy making that money. And it's about not wasting a single moment in your day. And, you know, today, when I look back and I realize, you know, what was that changed me? I realized that, I thought I want, I've always wanted to be accepted, but it's not being accepted that's important to me. What's really important is, is, is that craving for happiness. Um, and I lacked, I really lacked direction um, until I stopped doing what I was doing and stopped in that rat race and removed myself from the noise. And I discovered what my passion was. And there's another mentor who said to me, you know, whilst I've been in sales, what I've been in, and I've been a very good salesperson. She said to me, Gordon, you said, you're actually not a salesperson. All you do is you just help people. I said, you understand what that intrinsic motivation is in people and you get them to work. And, you know, what I do today is I don't chase the path that others tread. Um, I tread my own path. And I have this program, this philosophy now that's that's called Your Path, Your, your Path, Our Journey. And it's a really simple message for clients, for followers, and anyone listening here is – you know, you wake up in the morning and the first thing I say to myself is, I'm going to make a difference, not an excuse. And that's and that's the pivotal moment today. And every single day is a pivotal moment. It is a light bulb. It is that light bulb moment that goes, I'm here to make a difference, not an excuse. And that's where the visible guys, and that's who the visible guys today. I live in Melbourne, Australia. I have clients around Australia. I have clients in California. And in, um, in fact, I have clients where I like having holidays. And, Perfect. You know, it's, it's, which is always good. And as I, you know, as we spoke before we went live today, you know, yes, I have clients, but you know, if I can help one person and make a difference that one person's life today, then that's my job done. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that's very admirable. And you know, and I've also looked at this, you know, a few other ways. You know, if I can. Uh, you know, impact two people's lives, then I've grown the movement by one yes. and I've replaced myself if I were to die tomorrow. And, uh, you know, and I look at many things that way and I think it's a, a healthy perspective. I think it's very stoic, not stoic in the sense of like Seneca and, yeah. you know, stoicism, not from uh, the John Wayne, like, I'm not going to show you my emotions. So, but yeah, I think that's great. So, yeah. you know, going on this journey oh god i can't even imagine you know i'm sitting here like um uh, my heart kind of got in my throat hearing your story and I, there's a question i'm going to ask everyone's wanting to know um but i'm gonna hold on that question for a bit uh <laughs> so but I, i'm sitting here you know a heart in my uh you know my my throat and hearing your story and i'm trying to process <laughs> I can't, I can't process what, what was going on with you, but, um, you know, as you were going on this journey, trying to figure out, you know, the path and the journey that you were yeah. going to go on, you know, what, 
you kind of touched on this some in some regards, but what was holding you back? Um, you know, you, you climb this corporate ladder, you're very successful in the corporate world, but now you're like, you're an entrepreneur and you know, you, you got to have a lot of time off and, uh, you want to travel and you, you've got your wife, you know, Wendy that you're trying to take yeah. care of. Um, what other kind of things, you know, were going through your head, you know, fear and procrastination, shame, anything like that? Hey, look, there's <laughs> The thing that made the difference in my absolute in my career was I joined UBS Investment Bank um, in Melbourne, in Australia, and we ran a very, very successful business. And uh, two people that run that business today are still my my friends and my mentors. And one thing that they allowed at that point is they allowed innovation. And it was explained to me once that think about yourself as a stadium manager. You come in, you switch the lights on, you switch the lights off, and your team plays on the field. Sometimes they run off the field. And you just let them run off the field, but you push them back on the field because it's not you that necessarily is going to be a great leader. Doesn't have to tell people what to do. A great leader knows when to switch the lights off and when to switch the lights on and let the innovation be created. And, and that's something with all the other organization I've worked for that really missed. And I learned a lot in that stage. And I think, you know, there's some things you can learn at school, but some life skills, you just can't, you just have to experience it. And from working in my dad's shop at the age of five, through to what I did at UBS, the whole innovation really, I think, defined me. And I think for the next 10, 15 years in industry, that innovation really got squashed. Well, we talked about it. We talked about being disruptive and innovative. It really wasn't happening. There was always uh, negativity around it. And then something happened with the millennials. They went, bugger this. I don't want to work in an office. I want to be free. And I went, okay, well, I like that idea of you being free, but one thing I've got over you is 20 years, 25 years, 30 years of of life experience that you don't have. And I've just merely mixed the two together and gone, well, what was holding me back was holding the back of thinking that I have to fit that system, thinking that I have to fit that system. And today when I talk to firms and organizations, they still follow a very traditional path. If you want to be a future leader in seven to 10 years time, you need to start acting and being that future leader today, right? Right. And to be today, you that means that you can't decide that um, an accountant can't work, doesn't finish accounting the um, the accounting um, uh, qualification, then spend two years as a an accountant at this level, three years at a level, four years at that level. No, if you want to set your own firm up, you can set your own firm up. The only person I don't want to push the time span through is the doctors. I want the doctors and the surgeons to go through all the medical career right. and learn as much, <laughs> learn as, right. much as possible. Right? But you don't need to sit in your office. I mean, I know a law firm in Melbourne, in Australia, they expand. It's a virtual law firm. I think they've got 25, 30 people. Right? It's virtual. They do fixed fees. They're virtual. They're no longer saying that they have to be this traditional. And, and I think the thing that held me back was this thing of, I suppose, the, you talk about the shame or the embarrassment or the shame or the embarrassment to say um, that I'm not going to be the traditional system. I'm not going to be the traditional growth coach. Right? I'm a coach who goes, are you prepared to make a change? Yes. Are you cha- are you prepared for accountability? Yes. Um, and go on. My, my life, I don't, my life is a, um, I don't have enough time. I really don't have enough time. I, I run a medical charity. I'm a chair of a medical charity that's a lung transplant charity. And when we talk about passions, and I, I, I contribute a large portion of what I earn to that charity. And that charity is about saving lives. And we, say, and we are the world's number one charity in the world, uh, uh, number one research charity, in the, uh, lung transplant charity in the world. And that's a real passion. So for me, holding back in the shame – to create every single day I learn every single day I learn and that you know I, I, I coach a, a mentor a young lady and she's in Australia she, she's an Australian she's a South Sudanese and for those that don't know South Sudan is the is the youngest country in the world it's gone through terrible uh, civil war and she and she's an amazing lady and she says something to me when I sit down and we coach about what she wants to do and she says to me Gordon she said you know I will be one of the most influential people in Africa for the in the next 100 years. And I went, well, that's a statement. I said, you, I said, you will go more. She goes, you know what? I don't have time to dream small. And I went, wow. So sometimes it's about not what you, not the best advice you receive, but what you hear from others, people. And 
And I think that really resonated with me that to stop, I'm not embarrassed about what I do. I'm not embarrassed about my life. I talk about life and death because, it, hey, it happens. Three things happen. You get born, you pay taxes, and you die. Three guaranteed things, right? Right. right. Three, three guaranteed things yeah. are going to happen. Um, you never, ever stop being a better person than who you are or what you are. I, I used to say that in my life, when I look back in my life, I used to be cash rich and passion poor. Now, today, I, I say I'm cash poor but passion rich doesn't mean I've got no cash, but the thing that I really go for and the thing that really motivates me, the thing that really drives me is not the cash. It's the passion. And the two together, uh, you know, and that's, and that's what it's about. It's, um, you know, what would hold me back? Um, silly things in my business holds me back. Like I try to write blogs and because I'm dyslexic, it takes me eight hours to write a blog. So I just don't bother writing the blogs any longer. I'd rather comment. I'd rather comment. So things like that I've learned in my life to make me a better person. Yeah. <laughs> um, am Maybe. I embarrassing? Yeah, my wife says I'm embarrassing sometimes. Do I have fear? Um, I have no fear, and that probably is a fear, if that makes sense. <laughs> it does, yeah. yeah. Right? So I have no problem going to, going to someone and saying, you know, have you got money for my foundation? But not quite like that, you know, in a nice way. Um, I've got no problem asking, because if you don't ask, you'll never know. Right. Uh, I read uh, an Instagram and I wish I could find it again. And I, I, I used to talk about this on stage and I could never get the language right. And, and, and sh- the quote that this lady had was, it's all about the dash. Oh, okay. And the dash is your birth, the, that dash between your birth date and death date. Yeah. Yeah. And it's all about the dash. Yep. And I don't know if someone, I don't know if someone else said that and it's, she copied it. And I went, oh my God, that's what it's about. Right, everything you do is about that dash. Yeah, I have seen that before, and yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. And, when, and when people look at that dash, what are they going to say about you? Right. And I went in to say he he gave his best. He made a difference. He made the difference, and not an excuse. So, you know, you, you've made this huge transition. And yeah. you know, it, it sounds like you, you're, you're doing a lot of positive in the world and, uh, you've got this, you know, p- mission and I love the, the, you know, cash, cash, poor, passion, rich kind of motto that you have. Um, you know, what do you do? You know, you, you've, you've got your own business now. You, you, yeah. you just talked about, yeah, you do a lot of public speaking and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, you're on the board of this charity. You know, what do you do now to make sure that you don't fall back into, not necessarily going back into a corporate ladder, but you know, to, to question uh, the the societal norms that we have that we don't even know that exist that we kind of fall into the trap. You know, um, what what do you do to to make sure you're always growing as a person? Um, so part of being a coach and a trainer is you kind of like have to a coach or a mentor. I hate, I, I hate those words, coach and mentors. Yeah. I help people. I don't care what you call it. Yeah. I help people. If it fits my sweet, if it fits my sweet spot of what I do, then I help you. If it doesn't, then I'll introduce you to someone who, who does fit that thing. Um, so what do I do? I, you know, one of the things I talk about with people is surrounding yourself by those people that make a positive influence in you. And one of the hardest things I had to do was look at the people in my life that were, negative people and I, um i don't want to sound like i'm just using buzzwords here because it really was how i lived and you know there are people that i thought were friends that aren't friends yeah and longer. there were people after 20 years in the finance industry when i called upon for a little bit of help and not not i don't mean business help i mean personal help because i was in a dark space and i needed some help weren't there for me so in my life today i really don't surround myself with any negativity um when I market to people for my business, um, there's a very strict metrics I use along that process. And I've got coaches to help me with that. Um, and very strong metrics, very strict metrics. And if people don't want my business and don't want to work with me, and then I walk away. I don't, I don't worry about it. I walk away because there's a lot more people there. And that's not being arrogant. That is about spending your time with people that were going to make a difference to you. And you can make a difference to them rather than wasting time with people that don't want it. And what's really interesting is that we get a lot of stalkers in life and spruikers, and those people start following you. And even the, you know, my my biggest challenge today 
And what I really love is those people that said no to me 18 months ago are now saying yes. Yeah, yeah. It, because I was ready, because they weren't ready. Oh, and it goes back to what Monica said to me about, I don't have time to dream small. Just because you're not ready, I'm not going to stop. Right. I'm, I'm carrying on this path, and I'm going to carry on this path. The fact that you're not ready for that, that's your to, to change and to grow. And it's positivity. It really is positivity. It's about I work with people that say yes, can, will, and change. If it's no count, won't, then really, you, you're not my you're not my network. So it's funny you say that. A number of years ago, well, six years ago, I went to go see a mentor, and this was my very first meeting with him, and he said, tell me your story. And I started to tell the story, and within two or three minutes. Now, you know, this was, again, six years ago. I would have been 35 I had never been given this feedback and, you know, I'm, I've done pretty well for myself in the corporate world and elsewhere. And within two or three minutes, he, he's like, please shut up at this point. And I'm like, what? And he's like, you're using so many non-committal words. It's driving me crazy. And I don't really know who you are. And I'm like, wait, wh- what do you mean non-committal word? And he's like, well, you're saying should, maybe, but sort of he's like you're not taking a decisive action and this is your story this is your history and you can't even be comfortable with telling me your story and i'm like holy hell no one had ever given me that feedback before so you know this was supposed to be like an eight hour meeting and he is like all right so we're done this is 15 minutes i want you to go home here's your homework for the week and then we'll, we'll start up after that. So my homework was two things. One, um, look at all my writing. And I, I, I'm not dyslexic, but I freaking hate writing. Um, <laughs> so he's like, look at your writing and, you know, see if you can, you know, and I have an application that does this for me. Anytime I write these non-committal words, have it changed the word to something really big and red. That way it, it calls it to my attention. Second, record any conference calls I'm on and go back and listen to them and see how I speak in regards to using those non-committal words. And I did that for a week. And well, honestly, I did that for like two days. And I was like, I was just so flabbergasted by how squeamish and like how mousy I, I felt after listening to myself and I'm like, how does anyone respect me as a leader? And by the end of the week, I was already changing and I was already getting positive feedback. And I'm like, I'm 35. Why has no one ever told me this before? And then I went back to him for, you know, a couple of sessions after that. And it it was phenomenal. So it's freaking amazing how (laughs) just something that little shift how how big of a uh, importance that is so sorry to kind of get on my own little soapbox but i'm completely on board with you gordon i'm totally there and you you know what anyone that's listening to this your next team meeting that you go to and when a question is raised before you start the team meeting before you start the meeting just say the only phrases we can use today is yes yes can and will if you disagree with a if you disagree with a statement, you have to say yes, but you can't say but, and you can't say no, and just do that for that meeting and get someone to to be the the um, the, the, the gamekeeper, the, the gatekeeper on this, and call them up and just see how your conversation and your interaction changes when you use that language. Mm. It's amazing! It's amazing! It's a great exercise. My team's gonna hate me you now. But thank you. <laughs> I, do you know what? I get pulled up. I, I get pulled up on it. Yeah, I, I get pulled up on it all the time. That's the awesome. only person they get. The only thing that gets away with it is my dog when he says I don't want to eat. And I go, oh, fair enough, don't eat then. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but that's it. So, yeah, wow. So, you know, what kind of books uh, have been influential in your life and this journey of yours? So, um, yeah. So I can give you. I can give you the bullshit answer. I can give you the real answer. The yeah. bullshit answer is, oh, I read everyone's books. I read Tony Robbins, blah, blah, blah. Right. The real right. answer is I don't read any books. Okay. Um, because I don't like reading. Now, that really that, that doesn't mean I don't learn. 
I found that I learned from a different way. Okay. And it goes back to your path, your program. Yeah. So I learn a lot from, and you're going to laugh about this, MTV okay. and, Disco- and the Discovery Channel. Now, you know MTV, right. yeah? Oh, yeah. And you, and you know there's a program on MTV, I don't know, maybe you don't know, called Teen Mom 16. Okay. Right? And there's about teenage girls in, and it's a crap program, teenage girls in America who are pregnant and 16 it. Great. And 16. Fantastic. <laughs> That's fantastic. And, you're watching that. And you go, <laughs> right, and I'm, I'm lying on the couch watching this rubbish uh, because it's on TV and I've got nothing else to watch. And this girl comes in and she says to her mum, and she's got carrying a little baby and she's pregnant again and she's 16 years old and she's going blind. She's blah, blah, blah. And she's blowing away and her mum's blowing back to her swear. And I don't really understand what's going on in the accident. And her mum turned around to the, to the girl and said, you know what? It's about time you started to make a difference and not an excuse. Mm. And I went, oh my God, make a difference, not an excuse. I think I love that tagline. That's how I got right. that tagline. Right. I love it. And, I went, <laughs> and then I was watching another program called Survivor. And this is about people getting stuck on this island. Oh, yeah. And, they, and they've got to survive for like, tw- they've got to survive the longest by themselves and they've got to camp and everything else. And this guy was down near a river. And he said, I've got to get to the top where top of the mountain where the sunlight, so I can get some vitamins and vitamin E sunlight into me, whatever. And he said, I can go along this path, but there's probably going to be no food along that path because everyone's trod on that path. So I'm going to make my own work, man. I'm going to make my own path, but get to the top. So he created his own path. And at the top, he had a bag full of food. He was a lot stronger because he'd been eating along the way. And he joined the path at the top and he said, Right, okay, I'm ready to carry on my journey. And I went, oh, my God, your path, our journey. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so that's so. what I'm saying in this is I'm not saying to people don't read books, but the system says you must read books. No, no. The system says you must learn. You learn right. in the way that is most appropriate to you. So now I can watch MTV for all Saturday afternoon and not get told off from the wife because it's all education for me. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> love it. I love it. <laughs> Great. And I, you know, I I can't disagree with you. I mean, you know, I've learned so much from, I quote movies a lot or, you know, I've learned a lot from, yeah, I, I'm a movie buff. So I, I'm, I learn stuff from that that all the time. That's great, man. You know, I mean, I mean, mean, Rocky, I mean, Rocky doesn't say a lot in movies, but he came out with a line that every champion was once a contender. I'm going brilliant. I love it. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Rocky don't say a lot in a movie, but that is brilliant. Every champion was once a contender. Wow, that's awesome. No, that's great, man. Thank you for that. I, I might have a new excuse now for uh, Saturdays. So, you know, Gordon, you know, what kind of habits do you have? You know, just like personal habits, uh, you know, daily, weekly, or anything like that to kind of, you know, keep you sharp and, you know, to, to keep you moving forward. So, yeah, that's a really, really good question. God, I love these questions. Um, in fact, I'm going to take some of these questions and I'm going to use them in my coaching programs. Um, so metrics, I'm a very metrics person. So there's a couple of things I know I work in the environment that's right for me. So in June last year, so June at the year, June in Australia is the end of our financial year. Hmm. And every single twice a year, I sit down with my wife and we have a, we have a family strategy day. And we talk about what we're going to do in business and she's a professional network marketer, some of our goals, and we're on our eighth and no, no, our ninth, sorry, our 10th bucket list now in terms of our things we want to achieve and do. And she kicks me out of the house for work. She goes, you can no longer, you can no longer work at home. All my life I worked in a corporate office. So one of the big things I did was move into a corporate office. Um, the other thing about moving into a big corporate office is that you've got a big monthly bill, so that makes you do work to oh, pay yeah. the bills. Um, and I've realized that in order to be productive, I need to come to work in a suit. Um, I'm in work at 7 o'clock every single day, and I'll leave work no later than 4 o'clock. Okay? okay. So I said that, that, that is my metrics. Now, I've always been an early bird person. Sometimes, like this morning, I was in at 6 o'clock in the, in the morning. I'm always an early bird person. For me, that's a habit I get into. I know that when I'm in my shorts and my T-shirts, I'm probably going to be more thinking and innovating than I am actually sitting down doing number type stuff. Mm. Um, so I, I changed my habit to the, what I want to do. I've got no problem sitting in cafes if I want a little bit of more different inspiration. But for me, it's all about metrics. So 
everything I do is is metric bound. So I follow a particular marketing strategy and I've got targets per week in terms of how many connections I need to make, how many conversations, how many comments on articles I'm making, how many likes, how many shares, uh, how many, what, what I've got pretty strong metrics that I keep myself accountable to. And in doing this process, I've realized that my most productive day is actually a Sunday morning, two hours on a Sunday morning. Oh, wow. Okay. Right. Now people say, well, yeah, I don't want to work weekends. Yeah, but I actually don't work. Right. If I can work two hours on a Sunday morning, know that by Sunday night, other people are responding to me, my clients, my prospects are responding to me, and I've got four meetings set up for that week. Right. Yeah. I'll work for, I'll work for two hours on a Sunday morning. Um, so it, it's it, it's for what my habits are, for where I am. Um, but I've made sure that I can take my habits off my corporate desk and go and sit by a pool in Asia and do the same metrics there as I can go to California and do the same metrics there. Love it. So I'm not I'm not con- I'm not confined by my workspace to what I can do. I love it. And that's been really really hard. It's not. It sounds really simple. It's hard to get. And the other habit that's really hard to do is it's all right not to do it. It's all right if you make a decision today that you don't want to work, that today is the day you're not working. That's fair enough. You know, you go back to Muhammad Ali's quote, don't count the days, make the days count. I don't want to sit in front of a computer and do nothing all day. If I don't feel like working, then take the day off and spend the time with my wife. Yeah, and it grow, and I grow, and it grows, and it's amazing when you go and sit in a cafe and you go, "Hey, Tom, you're not working either." No, and you end up, yeah, you end up having lunch together. You end up having a right a life. You end up having a life conversation together about what you're doing in life, and this, and this, and this, and this. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing I've got myself into this year, I've got myself into basketball, and I love basketball. Um, Australia is a bit like America. We've got sports that last half the day. <laughs> yeah uh, right right uh basketball i love it it's economical to go to it's a great family environment even though i don't have kids great people it's fast it's it's easy to understand and that is something i do by myself i enjoy going to the game by myself you know it's a bit weird this but i meet so many people at the games that it's really really good and my wife's really but my wife's not into sport she hates sports and every time she goes to the team the team loses anyway, so that's why she doesn't go. <laughs> um, but I do it, so I find time for myself. So whilst I'm giving a lot to other people, it's really important to find time for yourself to do that. Wow. That's great. Yeah, and I'm very metric motivated as well. Yeah. And, you know, I, you know I'm, I do a lot of stuff in manufacturing, so data-driven and you know, seeing what moves the needle in a positive or negative direction, and uh, you know, making choices and decisions off of yeah. that. And to me, it's just, it's just, I'm a very logical person, so I, I love hearing that. And yeah, it's but it's in, go ahead. It's interesting, though, it's interesting though, because you know, when I am, um, you know, when we talked about doing the podcast together, you know, you send out very nice emails saying, you know, just, just some, just some, um, insights into how the podcast is is happening right you're actually setting the metric for the podcast you're not telling people what to do it's like you're giving them advice you know this is what's going to make a really great experience but you are actually setting the metric to how you are going how we're going to work together right but in a way and that's really important when you're setting metrics and you're talking to people it's not about um it's not about telling them at all and it's not even it's not. About, I always say you never tell anyone what to do, right? And you never show anyone what to do. Right. What you do is you share. Yeah. Right. You share experiences. You share stories. You share experiences, and let the individual decide on whether they, what what the next step is. Oh. Well, and that's well, and that's what it's about. Yeah. No. Well, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, you know, so I, I, you've got a lot going on. Um, in your in your life I, i'm curious yeah. is there um what are you currently working on you know what facet of your life are you trying to take to the next level right now uh to be happy okay well i know it sounds really weird so the next day, I'm, I'm never 
your your superhero is your full potential and you'll never meet your superhero mm. because when you think you're going forward you'll always realize that hey you can actually do more than what you actually think you can do and um, so at the moment for me uh, my business is growing i'm being very particular about who my clients are and what i'm doing i'm sharing stories but the charity that i'm doing I, i'm going to do a plug for the charity so the charity i, I have is called lungitude that's l-u-n-g-i-t-u-d-e and we are, you know, to give you an idea that when Wendy had a lung transplant, the average life expectancy was five to seven years. Today, we don't tell people what the life expectancy is because because of the research that we funded, you should be able to live a normal, healthy life. So the longest person with a life lung transplant is about 26 years. Now. Wow. Great. So, so that really changes. But what I really want to do and what I'm really working on is I want to build a center of excellence in Melbourne for lung transplant research, another another organ transplant research. Why Australia? Why Melbourne? Well, that's where the world's number one research trans- lung transplant team resides for no other reason. Hmm. And in doing that, I'm now networking, circulating with people of influence that are going to help that goal be achieved. It's not my goal, my dream that will happen. Um, because that's the type of legacy that I want to leave behind. Um, I know roughly how much the hospital is going to cost. It's going to cost about 750 million Aussie dollars. Um, and we need to find the money and the resources to do that. Um, but why not? Yeah. Sounds like a goal. Um, <laughs> Go <yeah>. for it. <laughs> well, <It's simple. laughs> No, I'm just saying it's a lot of money, but hey, I mean, you know, um, you're cash poor, passion rich. So, and <laughs> you've, um, you know, a, a passion, man, passion can do so much for you. So, so someone, someone said to me the other day, that's a lot of money. I said, I didn't know you could put a price on a life. Right. Exactly. Yeah. No, I think it's, <laughs> it, 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 <laughs> that's it, hard to answer that, isn't it? Yeah. No, it, it, totally. It's, it, yeah. It, it, absolutely right. It's, um, and, and we know today that because of the way the, the medical fraternity work, the research that we're doing in Melbourne is working with the universities in Canada, the universities in the US, with Spain and Belgium. It's it's a great um, incubation incubator to be involved in that people want to share information, not to make money, but for the sole purpose of helping other people around the world. And thousands of people around the world are benefiting that we don't even know. We don't even know that it started off when we started off you know to give you an idea three years ago we funded two embryonic projects worth ninety thousand australian dollars this year they've just received a government grant for 1.3 million dollars that will save an enormous and exponential number of lives but it could have never have started unless we started off mm. with the incubator it's exactly the same the way that apple microsoft and everyone else starts off with their technology and it's making a real difference and that's what it's about yeah. Well, <clears throat> you know, yeah, no, it, yeah, thank you. It's, yeah, I, I, it's, it's, the thing is like 750 million, right? Like, I, I'm, I'm not stuck on that number. I admire it because I do think a lot of people would have, I don't even think they would have done the, the research. The, no, most people would not have done the research to even find out what it would cost. They would have just like thrown the towel and going back to your Rocky. Um, yeah. You know, they were just like, no, the 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 big bad Russian in you know uh, the the fourth movie is too bad, and no, I'm done. But no, he, you know what did Rocky do? He freaking you know went to the Alps or wherever somewhere in the mountains and ran in the snow and did it old school, and. He, he just took it to the next level and he didn't let that get, you know, let him get it, uh, didn't let it get him down. And, you know, so there's so much to be said about, you know, your, your personality and your, your character that you're just like, yeah, you know, this is my goal and this is my figure and that's, you know, I'm, I'm going to do it. Um, yeah. And, when other people say no, I say, well, why not? Right. Well, people people throw the towel in when, okay, hey, you know, you you, you want to start a business? It's going to take you, hell, let's just sit, make it easy. Let's say two hours a week. And people are like, ah, uh, yeah, I don't have time for that. Or mm, no, you know, and it's like, what? Two hours. Yeah. That's all I'm asking. And, you know, you're saying, eh, you know, almost a billion bucks. 
you know? <laughs> so I love it. I love it. And it, it's just, it, it's all the way that you frame it and then you're in your mindset. So, um, so hey, Gordon, you know, kind of going just to some of the, the wrap up questions here. Sure. You know, you've gone through a lot. You've transitioned, you know, is it, multiple times over the last 12 years or so. Yeah. Um, you know, you do, um, uh, for a lack of better terms, mentoring, coaching, and you, you help people. You've got this awesome project with a, the, this uh, hospital that you're trying to build there in Melbourne. So if people are sitting here listening to this like, whoa, this, this dude's got so much going on. Um, and I'm just sitting here struggling uh, because, you know, for whatever reason, you know, they're, they're maybe not in the deep, dark hole or anything like that, but they're struggling in life. You know, what, you know, what kind of advice would you give that person? Okay. So, um, what I've, what I've learned through life is it's not how you get into the deep hole that matters. It's what you do to get out of the deep hole that really matters. And those actions you take to get out of that deep hole will define who you are and what you are going forward. And that's really, really important. So it's about looking forward. Yeah. It's not looking back. Uh, it's about keeping it real. Um, and it's, you know, it's a tagline that me and my wife use all the time, keeping it real. Mm. Um, that's really important. Um, change happens in life and change is really difficult, but you've got to take change as being on a positive manner that change creates opportunities for people. And that's what it is. And you, you never, you can have the best laid plans, but things happen that you are out of your control. Um, in my life, one of the biggest obstacles, one of the biggest barriers that I found to people's success is not the obstacles that they're talking about, but it's the priority of those obstacles. So people are trying to run before they can crawl. You've got to learn to crawl before you can walk, before you can run. And I think that's it, it is, is look at your priorities. And to me, it's about oh, I've had, I haven't had the career that I thought I was going to have, but I've got no regrets because I know that if I would have followed that path, I probably would be happy. But I'm experiencing so much now and so much richness now, richness now, mm. other things I'm doing and people I've been surrounded by. I'm I'm laughing. I'm, I'm like high on drugs every single. Feel like I'm on drugs high. Too, I shouldn't really say that, but I feel like I'm, I'm I'm high every single day, right? Right, because it's brilliant. And you know what? You know I don't want to put a spin on it, but you know I'm besides my wife at the moment. My my father's we we sort out an end of life program for my father. My father's terminally ill, so you know there's another barrier. There's another problem that I, my problems are no more, no worse than anyone else's problems. It's how you deal with them that really makes out who you are. Yeah. Right. I'm not looking for excuses. I'm not. I'm not looking for excuses. I'm not looking for people to feel sorry for me. Uh, I want people to say to me, "Are you okay?" Because that sometimes helps. You know, I'm not always okay, and sometimes I just need that mate on the side to say, "Hey, mate, is anything all right?" But for people out there listening to this, um, you know, you've got to believe in you. Right? You deserve it. And if you don't believe in you, right, and that belief is not strong and it's not strong, and I mean really it has to be strong, then you're going to quit because that's what happens. So believe in it. Believe that you deserve it, right? And start surrounding yourself by people that believe in you and believe you deserve it as well. It's, it's a really simple thing. A really quick exercise for anyone who wants to do this. Get a piece of paper, and on the paper, put down the 10, most peop the 10 people that you spent the most time with in your life in the last 12 months. When you've got that list, I want you to tick four people they are absolutely ambassadors to you. Go out and promote you to their network and their network. And then I want you to get another four people out of that 10. And they're the people that are going to be the biggest influencers in your life that actually help you influence where you're going to go. And you're going to be left with two people. And those are two people that take the most time and give you nothing in your life in the last 12 months. Get rid of those two people and concentrate on the next day. Wow. Well, all right. That's life. Yeah. Wow, I'm, I wrote that one down. That's hardcore, but you know it's um no it's tough. Uh, yeah especially I, with especially with the last two especially when the last two is your wife and your mother in law. <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah, no, it's um you know Jim Rohn's quote. You know, uh, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with, right? Um, yeah. So no, that that's a great See, exercise. 
You yeah. see, these are things that people quote things from books and everything else, and that's really good. What I liked is how people have taken those quotes and adapted it to their life. Right. Right. That's what I find really intriguing. So, yeah, yeah I know about James. I've never read a James book or anything like that, but it's how you use that. And it's you model yourself on you. Don't model yourself on what other people, on other people. Yeah. Right. I don't want to be a Tony Robbins. I don't want to stand in front of 20,000 people and just talk for 45 minutes, right. an hour. Uh, that to me doesn't engage me. It engages other people. That's fantastic. That's really good. All right. So I don't want to be a Tony Robbins. Simple as that. Well, uh, whether Tony whether Tony Robbins wants to be wants to be the visible guy, hey, he can come and talk to me. That's up to him. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Gordon, what's the best way uh, for people? You know, I'm going to put all the stuff in the show notes as well. But yeah. uh, you know, for you know people that. Typically, just enjoy the uh, the listening component of this. What's the best way for them to to find out more about you? So it would be a bit of a shame if the visible guy wasn't very visible on social media, <laughs> wouldn't it? Right. So, I um, <laughs> so look, the visible guy's got a uh, website. It's called thevisibleguy.com. Simple as that. Uh, I'm on um, Instagram at I'm the Visible Guy, and you can find me through LinkedIn. Um, you can put Gordon Jenkins or the visible guy, or you can just simply send me an email to info at the visible guy.com. Right. It's as simple as that. Was well, there anything that we didn't discuss <coughs> that uh, you would like to bring up before we uh, wrap up? Um, I would say anyone's listening to this that hasn't spoken to you about doing a podcast. Yeah. Go through the exercise because one of the things about me that I realized going through this exercise is happened. It helped me refocus on who or what. And it, but I also realized that shit, I've actually come a long way. I've actually had a really good life despite all the ups and downs. I've actually had a really, really interesting life. And you know, it, in Melbourne, it's uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. Now I'm going to have a bloody brilliant day today on the back of this. That's awesome. So I'd say, uh, say anyone that listens to this that hasn't done it, do it, right? Man, so that's the thing. Like, I don't have Tony Robbins on here. I don't need him on here. Every single yeah. person walking this planet has a phenomenal story. I really, yeah. truly believe that. And we all have you know, pivoted and we've all, you know, made some transition in our life that has been for the better and that someone will learn from. So, you know, I, it's why I love having everyone from everywhere on this planet uh, on the show. And, you know, that being said, you know, thank you very much, Gordon, for coming on and, you know, sharing your, your story and your journey with us. And, um, you know, just for, uh, honestly, for keeping it real. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. No, my absolute pleasure. And I suppose the one last thing I would do. Yeah. Anyone that is in that dark space, um, you're not alone. Um, you never are alone. Um, no matter how bad it is, there's always someone that wants to listen. So reach out. And if you can't find anyone, I'm here. Great. Well, thank you very much, Gordon. I really appreciate thank that. You. And uh, yeah. again, for your time and energy. Thank you. No, thank you, Tom. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. What an amazing interview with Gordon. I mean, there's so much in this and, you know, it, it's, it's truly amazing. This is like one of those stories you would see coming out of a Hollywood movie, you know, in regards to, uh, you know, his wife is, uh, what he believes is terminally ill. They're giving a time frame in regards to, you know, how long her life expectancy is, uh, going to be. And then they choose to do this amazing journey together. And at the end of that journey, um, you know, she uh, doesn't pass away and all is well. And uh, just, just the path that it takes them on and where it's led them to today and the positive change that they're uh, making into the world. I mean, just the story itself is in, pretty incredible. And then just hearing some of, you know, his stories and life lessons and what he has taken away on this and, you know, how he measures success, how he helps others. And just, you know, he, he's very out there, like in regards, just like, hey, this is who I am and this is what's going to make me successful and get me to that next level and ensure that myself and my family are happy and safe. And that's what I'm going to do. Um, he's just, he doesn't pull any punches. And I love this guy just so much in this episode. And, uh, 
you know, I, I just loved how he measures things, you know, not goals, but he has metrics. He, he found out Sundays were some of his most productive days. And uh, just, I don't know, just awesome stuff in this. Uh, what are your thoughts about this? You know, what were some of the key takeaways you had? Thanks for listening to the UpRev Ninja podcast with your host, Tom Hudson. Navigate to our website at uprev.ninja today, where you will find additional resources to help you discover the best version of you. While you're there, join our newsletter and join the discussion on your favorite social media platforms. We've got some awesome guests lined up to share with us how they are becoming the best versions of themselves. Again, thank you for listening. Now it's time to go out and uprev your life.